Hey, man. Welcome back to the Quintana Show. Thank you guys all for tuning in. Today, we're with one of my famous and most prolific guests, John Cabrera, former detective for the Sacramento City Police Department. How many years did you do there? 15 years in homicide. Yeah, yeah. And you, you, I mean, you're the guy that grabbed the body of the corpse with Dorothea Puente. You, uh, you've worked on pretty much every high-profile crime. And in any other city, that might be like a, you know, yeah, big deal. We're talking about Sacramento. And as you and I have discussed many, many times, Northern California, for whatever reason, has been kind of the hub of some of the most notorious criminals. And even not like necessarily criminal criminals, as you as you know, we're used to talking about them as far as serial killers and mass murderers, but even like people like Patty Hearst, right? Charles right. Manson, they all have these Sacramento ties. Everybody with bad intentions seems to be somewhere like two degrees from Sacramento. It's, pre- it's pretty amazing. And um, we just did a show on Morris Solomon with you, who was a forgotten yeah. serial killer in Sacramento. And one of the reasons why this case reminds me of the Morris Solomon case is that Morris Solomon worked in a place in Sacramento called Oak Park, which was, which was a ghetto at that time, right? right? It's being, it's, been refurbished now, and they're trying to put a shine on it. Um, but at that time, it was really a forgotten place in Sacramento. Yeah, a lot of drugs, a lot of gangs. Street walkers. Street, a lot of prostitution. Yeah. And, and Morris Solomon, a handyman, really what he did at that time when he was doing his thing is he was picking on those people who society would never miss. Right. right. Yeah, absolutely. Like no one no one ever goes, God, what happened to that streetwalker that was there two weeks ago? We need to go and look for her. No. Yeah. I mean, people just don't they, our society just doesn't care for whatever reason. And he knew that, right? right? And so those are the people that he targeted. And today we're gonna talk about for one year, <laughs> he was the most prolific serial killer in the United States. And his name was Juan Corona. And he originally came to Sacramento from um Jalisco down in Mexico, um, and then worked his way up to where his brother Natividad was, up in the Yuba City, Marysville area, and he was a labor contractor. And a labor contractor is a person that, you know, you're hired by the rancher or the farmer, and he says, hey, we're going to be picking X today. I need 15 people. And this, your labor contractor goes out with a truck, and he goes to a place where folks who want to work gather, Right? right? And he goes, we need 15 people. We're going to be picking peaches. Who wants to go? Right? And that's what he does. And that's what Juan Corona found himself doing in the 50s, right? Um, right. I think the late 50s, that's when he came to, to the Marysville, Yuba City area, and he fell into that line of work. Um, for those of you who aren't in the California or in the Sacramento area, um, even if you're in Sacramento, you not, might not be aware, but... Marysville and Yuba City are where the Feather and Yuba Rivers converge. It's the confluence of the uh, Yuba River and the Feather River. And it's really a very, very sad area. And I say that only because of this, because actually I represent uh, an entity out there, the Yuba, Yuba Water Authority, great people. But I say it's sad because it's a place where anytime you build (laughs) cities, where two rivers converge, right? The confluence of two big rivers that have a tendency to flood. It it just creates like a calendar of disasters. And that's what that area has always been throughout history. There have been, you know, periods of calm, and then you have a huge disastrous flood. Two majorous floods. Yeah. One in 1955 and one in 1986. The 1955 flood is important. Yes. Because that is one of the reasons that we believe that, well, Juan Corona, who we've been talking about, the farm labor contractor who moved to Yuba City in Marysville, I think there were episodes before 1955 which shown him to be a schizophrenic. Um, he was married, uh, he, I think he was married twice. He was married twice. But he had, he had a very violent temper, and he had he was prone to schizophrenic outbreaks, schizophrenic schizophrenia with uh, with bouts of paranoia, and he actually was hospitalized right, right. Uh, after the flood. Well, his brother his brother hospitalized him, had him committed to Dewitt State Hospital up the road in Auburn, California, and when he was up there, he went through some shock treatment, and I guess after so many shock treatments, they said you're good, you're good to go, and. 
he returned. But one of the things at that time was after he had received treatment, he was deported back to Mexico. And then he slowly made his way back up into California. But this time he would go all the way up to where his brother was up in Yuba City. So, so in 1956, he was hospitalized, as John said. He was put in uh, DeWitt Hospital, which I don't think it exists anymore. No. Um, but that's up in Auburn, which is in the foothills, like, well, Yuba City and Marysville are kind of the gateway to the foothills up in that area. Gold miners used to go up there and come back through those rivers. So um, this was right after the floods. The floods were in 1955. Right. And he was hospitalized in 1956 right. and diagnosed with schizophrenia, officially diagnosed with schizophrenia. Prior to the hospitalization, I guess he had been walking around saying that everybody was dead. And now let me be clear, the damage to the 19 to Marysville and Yuba City in 1955 was as bad as we have seen anywhere in the United States. Yeah, and I saw the after effects of it because we traveled uh, with our family from Sacramento to Linda, California, which is just a little side road off of Marysville. Mm -hmm. And so when we traveled up Highway 70, my father would point out after passing East Nicholas, he would always point out little houses that were way out in the fields. And he'd say, you see those dirt lines? That's where the water was. So you could see the actual water line on these houses that were completely flooded. Yeah, there were the the damage to to Marysville and Yuba City in 1955. I think was uh, they said it was 65 million dollars, and I did the math on that, and that comes up to 700 million dollars today. And let me tell you, these are poor little farm towns. Yes. So 700 million dollars worth of damage in today's dollars to these areas at that time. I mean, they're bigger now, right? But at that time, they were a little. They were very small ag pure ag towns. That was an amazing amount of damage to these areas by that flood. 38 people died in that area in 1955. Right. In fact, the, the, the client that I work for, the Yuba Water Authority, they were created through legislation because of those floods. They said, enough of this. <laughs> we need to tame these rivers. And they built a beautiful reservoir um, up the rivers. So so those, those floods had a so had a had a pretty major impact on a guy that was already on the edge, right? Yeah. With the schizophrenia. And that's what led to his hospitalization at DeWitt, which led to the ECT therapy that he received, as you said, 23. Uh, he had 23 shock therapies yep. while shock he was there. Shock therapies, yep. And then he was, again, deported, right, after back that. Back Mexico. In 62, he came back. Yes. And then he worked his way all the way back up to Yuba City again with Natividad. Now, Natividad, his brother, is a very interesting fellow. Um, I wish we knew more about Natividad. Natividad Corona, Juan Corona's brother. He had, I mean, he's actually had a good head for business. He had a cafe um, in uh, Marysville. Marysville. Called the Guadalajara Cafe, and I guess it was a pretty popular place. You want to talk about Natividad a little bit? Well, I don't really know much about Natividad, and we never really found out much a bit about it because there was an incident at the cafe where he attacked another individual. Well, the individual filed a lawsuit against him, a civil lawsuit, and he won. And right after that time, Natividad fled back to Mexico. Now and he wouldn't he wouldn't come back. He'd eventually die there. So Natividad was at that time, and remember we're talking about and that that attack happened in 1970. Yes. So it was right before um the, the arrest of Yeah, it was right Juan before Corona. yeah, right before he went on his spree. And it was a spree because it, when we talk about the people he killed, he killed he, he did all of his damage probably within a couple of months. Yes. Um so the Guadalajara Cafe, owned by Juan Corona's brother, Natividad, I think it's notable for two reasons. One, well, three reasons. One, the attack was very similar, right? And this is going to lead to conspiracy th theories later. Right. And defenses, mm -hmm. the court defense. Because the attack was in the bathroom on a younger man with a machete. So the machete, of course, many people who, know, who have heard of Juan Corona know that he's called the machete killer. Um, or the machete murderer. Murderer, yeah, yeah. The machete murderer. They like that, uh, you know, the, the two M's. So, so it w the machete seemed to be his weapon of choice, and the young man was attacked in the bathroom with machete. I think it pretty much scalped the guy. Um, and he was left unconscious in the bathroom. Juan was in the cafe at the time, right? When the incident happened. When the incident happened, yeah. Juan was in the cafe. So there's still... 
uh, uh, many people who think that Natividad was covering for Juan. Now, I, I'm not saying that's true, but I have read that, you know, a lot of people were saying, no, nah, Natividad was covering for Juan and, you know, whatever. Juan was blaming Natividad. The Guadalajara Cafe is located right across the street from what they called Wino Park. It was a grassy little area across the street from the Guadalajara Cafe. And the people who stayed there were just kind of the forgotten people. The winos, at that time, what they called the winos, the tramps, right. the itinerants. You know, the people who came up there just traveled up the railroad tracks, you know, followed the river up there. And it was kind of the end of the highway at that time. And they just kind of settled around Marysville, right? Marysville was that kind of, it was kind of yeah. a rough town. They had a lot. And um, two of my uncles were police officers in Marysville. And they used to tell us the stories about, yeah, every time they got paid, if they worked somewhere and they got a little bit of money, it was just a drunk fest. And they spent lots of their time picking up drunks in the paddy wagon. And they'd say, we'd pick them all up, and then they'd take them and sober them up and then turn them loose the next day. So back to Natividad. So the final reason why this is important um, and why people kind of use the whole this as part of the – and I call it a conspiracy theory, but believe me, there are a lot of people that don't believe, believe it or not, that Juan Corona is guilty. Uh, still. No, I, 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 we heard it. I heard it with other law enforcement people. Yeah. Because we watched it on the second trial. You know, it was going on, and I was working homicide, and we talked about it a lot. And yeah. We looked at the evidence. We explored a lot of that, mm -hmm. and um, it was, you know, it was just a little. To me, my personal opinion, it was just a little shaky. It, yeah, the whole thing. I, and we could. Well, I know we'll talk about this later at the end. But my, I've what I've always said about the Juan Corona, Juan Corona case is, I think he's the most likely guy, but I don't think it's tight. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know. Right. Um, but I, if I had to pick one, I would probably pick him. Um, but the other reason that, that Natividad plays a role in this and it plays a role in the, in the ongoing narrative of Juan Corona is that uh, it was a young man in the bathroom. And Natividad, remember, we're talking about 1970. Right. And it was a very different society out here. And um, Natividad was an open homosexual at the time. He was an open yes. gay man yes. at a time when that just wasn't really done. Even in California in 1970, it was very rare. And especially in those cities. In, yeah, that's right. In, in those towns. In a deep ag town. That was extremely frowned upon. That's right. Uh, and so this will come back into the story later when we talk about the victims, but just remember that now, um, that Natividad, right, it was a bathroom, it was a young man. And so all of this is kind of playing together. They go to court. Um, the victim actually wins a huge settlement in 1970, yeah. $250,000 from Natividad. So Natividad rolls up <laughs> the yeah. Guadalajara Cafe and he heads back to Mexico. Right. And that just leaves Juan there with his family at the time. Remember, he's still married. He's got four kids. Right. And he's a, a farm labor contractor. So I think that brings us now into where we're at right before we start getting into the discovery um, of the bodies. You think we laid it out enough? We got everything there? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, just just to go back uh, briefly and talk in 1955 after the flood, uh, some believe that schizophrenic behavior uh, came about when he had told family members who later would tell uh, attorneys who would be defending him that Juan believed that the people that he was seeing were ghosts. Were ghosts. And in today's genre, they would be called zombies. So he was seeing these people, you know, that he thought were dead walking around. And um, that that supposedly was his, you know, maybe the way he attacked these people or yeah. he thought they should die. That's right. That's a really good point because yeah. that when he was when he was sent to DeWitt after the floods, that's what he was saying. He thought that everybody had died. Right. And everybody in the flood. In, in the, the flood. flood. In the 55 flood, everybody had died. And then everyone he saw was a ghost. Ghost. So he was hospitalized one more time for schizophrenia yes. in 1970. Uh -huh. That was around right before the attack on um, the, the young man in the bathroom at the Guadalajara Cafe. Um, Natividad splits to Mexico. And less than a year later, in May of 1971, farmer is inspecting his peach orchard and he sees a hole. Right? You want to take it from there? Yeah. Well, what happens is uh, the farmer on the ranch, he goes out. And this was, I believe, the Sullivan Ranch in yeah, New York City. Yeah, right. And um, the farmer goes out and he sees this freshly dug hole on one day. So he apparently doesn't think, ah, eh, you know, there's a hole there. He comes back the next day and it's covered with loosely, you know, loosely thrown dirt. And so right away he thinks there's something up here. And he calls the authorities. They come there. They do a little digging. 
lo and behold, they find a body. And they see what the condition of the body in. And this is a body that's been hacked and it has no head. And that was the first victim they found. Now they didn't they, they found a couple of meat receipts, right, with Juan Corona's name on them. They right. had some deposit slips, bank deposit slips, mm-hmm. and some re- other receipts that they'd found, and that gave them the information now to start pointing the finger and starting to investigate who might be responsible for. That's it. right. And then they went out and they started looking around further, and they yeah. found more holes, yeah, more graves. And I know they brought out um, they brought out infrared. They put infrared because that's what they used at the time. Yeah. They used infrared uh, technology was <laughs> zilch. I mean, uh, yeah. you know, you could either use uh, that type mm-hmm. of instrument, or you could use like I did in 1988, where you just took a steel rod, you poked it into what you thought was a grave, and then you got down there, and if you hit anything, you know, that was it. That was you discovered the body. Uh, but that there wasn't really any technology mm-hmm. then. They did the best they could. So, yeah, they, it, they were finding bodies. Yeah, they were using the infrared technology, and people were uh, were bringing lights out to to you know they fast they found as they spotted the holes in the orchards over there on the yeah. Sullivan Ranch, right? right, which is right next to the feather. They would, um, and you got to remember. I mean, I I don't know what he was thinking because this area floods so much. Yeah, I'm thinking. Well, maybe he thought it would wa- it would take the bodies away. I don't know. I don't know what. Yeah, he was it's thinking. it's. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, you don't. You wonder why he didn't just put them somewhere else. Somewhere else, right? Yeah, like yeah. up in the mountains or yeah. in the hills, because they're take right next away. to the mountains. Yeah, but he he again he does the same thing that other serial killers have done. You know, John Wayne Gacy. You know, why didn't he take the bodies out anywhere? He buried them under his house. Yeah, he buried them right. under a patio, under a barbecue pit. You yeah. know. Uh, so it's the same thing. And, yeah. You know, he, maybe he felt comfortable mm-hmm. that he knew where the bodies were and the orchard wasn't going to tell on anybody. So yeah. um, he felt that he was safe there. So so um, with all the technology moving, now this is becoming a huge story. It's becoming, it's becoming a, I mean, regionally, I remember it was a big, big, big story. Um, I was in the, I was young at the time, but I, even, even as a young kid, I remember seeing the name and seeing the pictures and seeing the bodies being carried away, right. With the sheets on them right. from Juan Corona. And I'll never forget that name, Juan Corona. Um, I always had these images in my head cause I was so young when these murders happened. Right. So they eventually found 25, 25, 25, 25 bodies. Um, four were unidentifiable cause they were yeah. hacked up so bad. But what they what they notice is that like fifteen of them, and they all had the same mo. They were um, hit in the head either like with a club or a machete, and then stabbed in the chest. Yeah. Um, so it seemed to be the same mo, and then they were buried in a hole with their arms and hands around their head. Now I'm not sure what that meant. So one of the behaviors that we see in in Juan Corona at this time uh, as the killer is that a lot of fifteen of the twenty five were found in a state of undress. Um, a lot of the 15 of the men were found either with their pants around their ankles or completely missing pants. And it seemed that, and I know a lot of people have talked about this, and I don't know if you've given this a lot of thought, but a lot of people were wondering if, you know, given his relationship with his brother, um, if, and at that time in San Francisco, uh, gay men and women were first now starting to assert themselves and, and create a voice and go move for, you know, rights for, for right. what they do, uh, how they live their life. And, um, you know, there was a lot of pushback in areas like this, right? right? And especially if you are, you know, a conservative Mexican straight up from Mexico, so you're straight up from Jalisco, right? You know, there might have been some pushback there, but he was also known to be a man who was uber masculine, Right, like you know, quién es muy macho guy? Yeah, muy machismo. Yeah, he was he was one of those guys. So it seemed like you know he doth protest too much, uh, and he was always very very um, aggressive anytime he saw somebody who he thought might be gay um, or was gay. Right, like yeah. he would be a, in a bullying or you know try right. to start a fight. Um, so have you? What what were your thoughts on on that aspect and why these men were found that way given his behaviors? Well. There are some that speculated that um, the victims were raped, a, a certain amount of them. I, and I've heard that. Raped. Right. And so, but at that time, there's no DNA. You, there, I mean, there's nothing that you could get a, a close to a DNA other than you, you had some other body fluid, which 
if they could identify at that time because of the state of the bodies are in the ground. But, um, you know, that was the allegation is that uh, he raped these individuals. And that would be, again, part of the defense that it wasn't Juan that raped them. It was Natividad. Right. That's right. Yeah, And that's what they tried to say. Well, no, Natividad, everyone knew was a known homosexual. That's right. So obviously, and then maybe Juan covered for him. Now, that didn't come out in the stories that I was reading when I was a kid. Yeah. The, the, you know, the whole, um, the, right. you know, the whole homosexual angle to these murders. Well, it was still, but, I mean, it was yeah. still kind of a taboo thing to talk uh, about or, you know, to explain to anybody. Yeah. As you read it now, though, as you do the research now, you're like, holy cow, this thing is rife with those undertones. Yeah. Yes. Um, but at that time in the papers, it really wasn't talked about much. No, no. Uh, so, so in May, they very quickly, because of the receipts, because witnesses had seen Juan in the truck with these right. individuals, with right. many of the individuals, um, they decided that, you know, his name is on meat receipts in the graves. His name is on bank, you know, Bank of America deposit slips in the graves. Kind of some of the sloppiest, I would think. Right, but, and a search warrant. We got to remember there was a search warrant after he was arrested. They did a search warrant on his home in Marysville. That's right. And they found machete had blood knives with blood they found a gun they found other things uh, they found shovels shovels yeah and most of all they found his ledger let's talk about the ledger because that became both a good thing and a bad that became one of the key pieces in prosecuting him but also became one of the key pieces in those who want to defend him right so you want to talk about the ledger because the or, or they call it the death book or the, right. the murder book or you know as many names for it. Right, because uh, what they found that there was a certain amount of the names that were in his ledger, and that the ledger was he kept of all of the people that he brought on as a contractor. But they found that there was a, a good amount of these names that were the victims, and they had dates on them. They believe are the dates that he had killed them, and so that's what. You know, the prosecution alleges that this is this is showing us that he killed him, but he also put the date down there when he got rid of him. And uh, that was that was what was unique about the ledger. And so the press, the press um, got a hold of this. Right. And the press was out there in this, you know, out there in public calling it, oh, the death book, oh, right. the, you know, the, the murder book. book. And I think his his defense, you know, really hooked on to that, saying, well, look, there's no way this guy can get a fair trial. I right. mean, but overlooking the fact that they did find shovels, they found a bloody club, yeah. they found a bloody machete. Clothing, you know. they found bloody clothing. Yeah. And again, you, you got to look at the technology. They just couldn't take the clothing and run DNA like they could today in a matter of minutes, if need be, and, you know, get some results. I mean, there was nothing. You could type blood. You could type blood and say this is, you know, what, what type of blood it was or if it was from a human or an animal. You could do that. But at that time, beyond that, it was very little. So do we know if they were assaulted? Because I've, hear, I've heard people say that they were, you know, uh, these victims were assaulted. But it's not really clear. And as you said, there was no right. DNA at the time. Right. And a lot of the bodies were so hacked up and decomposed. Right. Um, what, have you, what, what are your thoughts on that? I, I think it's uh, probably through the autopsy that uh, the pathologist, uh, you know, with the examination, uh, believed that uh, they had, you know, possibly been raped. It must have been something. A mm-hmm. visual that they could make the determination. But there was nothing I could never find or read anything clear about mm-hmm. it, other than if you read the specific pathology report. You know, um, other than that, it was just a lot of speculation of what had happened. So before we get to the trial, I think one of the things that's most interesting, and I did touch on it a little bit in the beginning, is that um, Juan Corona from, from Mexico, um, he only would work as a farm labor contractor with green carded Mexicans, everyone that he hired. For those people that hired him right. as a labor contractor was were green carded Mexicans. Um, interesting, all of his victims were white. Um, so, yes. so, and not only that, I think as we mentioned before, they were itinerant. No one would miss them. Um, most of them, and I'm not saying this to judge them, but it's just what it was. Most of them were known to be, you know, alcoholics at that time. They would call them winos and um, pretty much homeless at the time. Right. right. And they hung out in the park. So it makes one believe that Juan never had any intent of using them for labor, that he used the farm labor if he was the killer, that he used the farm labor contractor uh, bit as a ruse. Yeah. To get them somewhere, get them alone, and then attack and kill them. Yeah, I mean, there wasn't really any, even to this day, 
that I can recall, there isn't any real clear motive. Never found what the real motive of doing it was. Um, because he denied everything, of course, until 2011 when he right. he comes out in a parole hearing in 2011 and he says that, uh, um, yeah, he killed him because they were winos and they were trespassing on his property. But that, but that was the only time he would say that, and he would later recant that statement. Yeah, and there are many who say that he had dementia at the time. Right, he was already suffering some kind of yeah. Yeah, all kinds of different uh, mental, mental yeah. problems. So the other the other thing to note is that when he decided to do this, he really leaned into it because of the twenty five folks. I think all of these were traced to be in, in a matter of like two months. Right. Um, in those first two couple of months of nineteen seventy. Yeah, I mean, you got to wonder what set him off. What yeah. set him off that he just started, boom, he was just going head over heels, killing yeah. these people. I mean, was it the fact that he couldn't stand them or they were winos? I mean, or were they, you know, as far as working, were they doing the job? I mean, these are these type of individuals that he would pick up. They were drunks. Uh, he would pick them up. He would, uh, they'd work a day or two because they knew they could get money to buy more alcohol. And, uh, you know, it might have been something that frustrated him. But looking and finding out, you know, to this day, what the motive was, what what was a trigger? Was there a trigger about any of them? You know, it's uh, still really unknown today of what specifically caused him to start killing all of them. At, at the rate he did. Yes, that's a lot <laughs> of people. He was like, he was like, you know, not to laugh about this, but I mean, he was, you know, 20, 20, 25 people that we know about, that right? We know about. in like two months, right? That's that's just an amazing rate. He 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 went for. He woke up in December. With a clean record, and in two months he was America's most prolific serial killer. Yeah. So that that's pretty fast. Really, uh, I mean that we know of. Yeah, that we know of. So I mean, before we get into the trial, as we were moving into this trial, because this trial is just as big a star of the show, honestly, as the beginning. Yeah. Because this was a very long trial and a very controversial trial, and it also became kind of a racial trial. Um, with, we talked about the, you know, the gay rights movement out in San Francisco at the same time we had the Chicano movement in California and you had the Brown power movement, right? Power. And for some reason, Juan Corona was latched onto a, as a cause. But as we go into this area, so we're in 1971 and we have to look where California is at that time. And, you know, as I mentioned before, I mean, we had the Zodiac killer, Right. Who was out there. We were having, we were, we were beginning the Charles Manson trial. So you had Charles Manson, uh, you know, now being tried and all of his Manson family with all their antics. We had the zebra murders and a lot of people don't talk about the zebra murders, but it was going on at the same time that the Zodiac killers right. were going on. And what it was, it, it was a group of four African-American guys that were going out and honestly just killing white people. Yeah. Just killing them, finding them and shooting them and killing them. That was it. Yeah. And they killed 15 people and very little people. I, I don't think I know anyone who knows about the zebra yeah, murders. Yeah. Maybe it's not politically correct to talk about, but it was a big deal. And it had the city of San Francisco. Cause remember, it's the same time that the Zodiac killer is going on. And in fact, it kind of got in the way a little bit of the Zodiac killer. Right. Do yeah. Want... And, and people couldn't understand what were these killings part of the Zodiac or what was going on here. But um, yeah, I thought it was, I, and I remember it clearly, the zebra killers. Uh, you know what they were doing, and uh, it just it just raised havoc in the Bay Area. Yeah, with with these two different uh, killers, these these teams going on. You know, yeah, it's it, crazy. It, and then at the same time, you up here in Marysville and Yuba City, you got now you got Juan Corona. Um, yeah, so it was a really crazy time, and that's not you know even touching on some of the other things that are going on in other places, like in Houston, uh, we had the Candyman, who within a year of Juan Corona would be killed but would then be known as the absolute most prolific serial killer at that time right? Uh, with 28. And they quit counting at 28, the Houston PD, yeah. because they were afraid they would look bad <laughs> if yeah. they kept counting the victims. Yeah. And you have to wonder about, you know, why did, as far as uh, the investigation, they found 25. I mean, did they consider that enough or how far or what did they do to extend the investigation mm -hmm. Or if there was any other place. Yeah, yeah I've Juan wondered Corona. about that too. Like, why 25? I mean, we got well, there was a lot. And, you know, in fact, Sutter County couldn't even handle the body count. What they did was they'd ask Sacramento County Coroner's Office to take the majority of those victims and they held, did the autopsies down here in Sacramento. And, uh, and I remember specifically uh, the paper talked about there were so many bodies because it was at the, it was at the coroner's office, the old coroner's office. And they had a gated yard with kind of a, 
slack fence around it. But there were so many, they had to put the bodies out there. And they that's where the body, and I remember driving by, you could see through the slats. Yeah. And you could see they had all these different things out there with all these bodies. And then they would just take them in as they could get them. And then, you know, because their freezer couldn't mm-hmm. handle all of them. Yeah, good point. Because these bodies were kind of all uncovered at once, right. right? It wasn't like it was a guy who killed 25 over, you know, a period of years. No, this was these, all these bodies were being undug. It was like a wartime, a battlefield scenario. Right. So, yeah, they had to use those types of techniques, which is pretty amazing. And I remember seeing those pictures. Yeah, and you figure if they would have been any later, those bodies would have eventually just, uh, you know, meshed right into the soil broken down, you'd had the bones, but as far as identifying them, it would have been so difficult at the time. So yeah, they were they were all there, but there were so many of them. Again, mm-hmm. they had to ask Sacramento County uh, coroner's office to take them. And I remember, wow, let's drive over there. And you could drive over there and you could see, you know, that they were just piled and they had a lot of them that they were trying to get in for their autopsies. So the trial starts. So yeah, he had Roy Vanden Heuvel was his initial uh, public defender, and he had all the psychiatrists and the psychologists, and it was going to be a typical yeah, it's going to be an insanity defense, right? Right. Because the guy was he he had twenty three you know known ECT treatments, he'd been hospitalized twice for being a schizophrenic, but Juan Corona didn't want that, and then he was approached by this charlatan, and I hate to say that, but yeah. I've seen the guy talk. I've, I've, I've seen, you know, video of him from that era. He looked like a car salesman. His name was Richard Hawk, and he was a private defense attorney. Right. And he came to Corona, and he said, look, I'm a private defense attorney. You know, I'm a Cadillac guy. I will represent you for free. Just give me the book rights and uh, waive your client attorney privilege. Other than that, though... Yeah. I got you. Yeah. The first thing he did was get rid of all of the psychiatrists and psychologists. No, we're not going to do an insanity defense. We're going to innocent. Yeah. And that's when everything started going south. It went south. So were you watching that trial as it occurred? And- um, I just kept, I didn't watch it, but I was keeping up with the news of what was going mm-hmm. on because it now became really interesting. And a lot of people did. They wanted to see how this thing was. But, uh, you know, even I thought, gosh, at that time, you know, here you have somebody that's just killed 25 people he's being tried for, and he's schizophrenic. He has his background. Yeah. And I, th- I sometimes think that in his mind, he thought, hey, the guy's going to be guilty anyway. This many bodies, who's going to find a person innocent? I think he just wanted the rights, and I think he wanted all of that. And just he thought, let's just roll the dice and see what happens. My opinion is they don't have any evidence uh, in the case uh, really worth uh, any serious consideration at all. I'll be very surprised at the end of the trial that if they have I'd be very surprised they got two votes. Uh, the prosecution got two votes. I expect at least 10. And uh, I, I think if they could hang the jury, it'd be a major victory for him. Yeah, and so Richard Hogg did. He rolled the dice. Yeah. Unfortunately, it was, you know, Juan's dice. Yeah. And um, it, uh, a year later, in the, well, after the trial actually, you know, began, it was moved to Solano County, which, as, as you know, as funny as the world may be, I also did a internship with that DA's office, <laughs> but they had a different courtroom by the time I got there. Uh, we were across the street in a new building, but they moved to the Solano County um, courtroom because it was much, it was a bigger facility. And, you know, there was a ton of media on this. The entire nation, you know, had their cameras focused on the Juan Corona case. And he'd, he, what made it a, a good place to be is that he'd had some medical issues. He, uh, I think he had, he told mm-hmm. him he was having heart trouble and a lot of stuff like that. So, that move down there made it easier because Vacaville mm-hmm. uh, Correctional Facility was there, and they have the medical services that they offer there. So it was easy to keep him there if any medical stuff was needed. And then he was right there in Solano County to yeah. go to trial. So it all it kind of fit uh, what they needed at the time. And so this is where you see um, the the um, Chicano movement starting to to fold into this because if you look at if you look at tapes from that era, like I was watching old old news tapes on on the Juan Corona trial, and when they're t- when they're interviewing people out on the street, it's all about he's being railroaded because he's Mexican, um, and you hear the Brown Power chants in the back, a Chicano power. You talk to them for a few minutes, my dear. You form the form your judgment about them the same way you form your judgment about anybody else you come in contact with. You know, I have to I have to decide whether a car salesman or a real estate salesman or an insurance salesman is being honest with me. And it's a subjective thing. Do you think you'd be likely to try to challenge somebody who is familiar with uh, La Raza, which is one of the things Mr. Hawk is asking them about? 
No, not necessarily. Someone who's been interested in civil rights, would, would that be a mark against them or for them, or how would you look at it? No, well, in that area, you might be getting into an area where uh, a juror would reveal feelings that, about the defendant that uh, would certainly cause us to look at him very carefully. And I did not know that that was a part of this either when I was younger. I like that really didn't make the news at that time no. where, where, you know, where I was. Right. But if you're watching some of the raw feed on these newscasts, um, yeah, you see it all over the place. Brown power, Chicano power, you know, you're railroading the Mexican because he was from Mexico. And actually, right. one of his brothers came all the way up, right, and was trying to get into the courtroom and the judge wouldn't let him in the courtroom. My name is Pedro Corona. I has come from a long ways to see the trial to my brother, and I don't understand why the judge give the, us those orders to don't go in, because he are the crooked, he don't are the man, because he changed his mind when my brother supposed to go and bail out, and he changed his mind. I like it, do a question straight to him, why? He comes so late sometimes, and he, he do, can do any time what he want. He are the, the God, or what he are. Well, you think you should have the equal right also like, to come late? I like to get the, the same rights to everyone, because I am Mexican, and I got the right same to every nationality, because I got blood in my hands and my body. I feel same to everyone in the world. And it became a really, really big deal. Um, so, so there was that leaning into this also. So now you had, you know, the, the, the racial aspect to it on somewhat of a, not the firmest case. I mean, I know they found a lot of things. I don't know if the ledger, the ledger didn't have everyone that was killed. No, I think it had about, it was full of names, but I think they picked somewhere around like, seven or eight names. You're right. There were like seven, eight out of 32. It. Right. Right. That was it. It was, it was. A small number out of the ledger, but uh, you know, if it, there were 32, they took seven, yeah, seven. yeah. And it just seemed like it was, I, I don't know, man. I, I just felt like it was, like I said before, yeah. I think he was the best fit, but it just seems like it was a little shaky. Well, you got to look back at everything then and, and that time, you know, in, in 1971. I mean, technology was zilch. Uh, if you kill this many people, I think you had. Um, you were going to generally say, well, if you, they found something, it's going to be you. So I, I just felt that they just looked at whatever evidence there was and they made up their minds and they were mm -hmm. going to find him guilty. Yeah, there was definitely, from what I've read, there was no, there was no sign that they ever investigated anybody else. No. Other than Juan Corona. Right. Other than, and then other than his, down his, the brother, road, his brother in the second trial. Dad, but nobody else, nothing else was brought yeah. up. So in 1973, uh, Richard Hawk, who had rolled the dice with uh, Juan Corona's life, life lost, and um, he was convicted of 25. Um, he was found guilty 25 murder, uh, first degree murder, first counts. degree murder. Yeah, and he was given 25 life sentences to run consecutively, uh, which is a long time. That is a very long time. Long time. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a long time. That's like biblical. Yeah. Long time. So, um, and, and of course, at that time, he was the most prolific serial killer in the United States for one year until uh, the Candyman down in Houston, again, as we touched on. Yeah. They found 28 bodies, and the Houston police literally quit looking for more bodies because they felt it was making them look bad. I believe that was Dory, wasn't it? Uh, uh, Coral. Cor yeah, yeah, Coral. Coral. Okay. Yeah, he was. Uh, yeah, actually, I, I would. I don't think I would ever cover his his crimes on this show because it's just too horrible. What he would he'd use children yes. as bait for other children right. until the children revolted, mm -hmm. and uh, that was the end of the Candyman. So, um, in 1978, uh, the appellate courts took a habeas corpus and they actually overturned um, the 1973 conviction for ineffective counsel. Um, because come on, let's admit it. This Richard Hawk dude was just a yeah, piece of was, work. It was pretty obvious, I think, of what was going to happen. I mean, yeah. it was terrible. He was in it f just for the rights to the for the dramatic rights and for you know the literary rights. And um, in the second case, right in 1978, well, at, that began after the overturn in 1978, and he was given a new trial. Remained in prison though. Right. Um, this is when they started going after his brother. Right. Right. This is when they started going. In the going, second trial, yeah. right. They went after, uh, th they went for that idea that 
It was Natividad that did this. And they use all of those points that we've just talked about. He was a known homosexual. Uh, he attacked uh, Mr. Raya down in, mm -hmm. in his re at the restaurant. And all these things, and that's what they were trying to say, you know, the allegations of the victims had been raped and uh, how they had found them. And so they used that. They started to build that defense. And you, you really have to think about it. You know, his brother flees. And why did he flee? Did he flee because he was going to get rolled up on a, on a civil liability suit? You know, which the guy won. I mean, what, what you have to look at what was the motivation, and nobody ever pursued him. And before they even thought about it, he was dead. You know, and, and honestly, and I hate to like sound like a conspiracy dude, um, but we don't know that before Natividad flee, uh, fleed back to Mexico that he didn't put the stuff in Juan's, you know, House. Well, that that was the allegation. Right. That's that's what they were talking about on some of these news yeah. reports. They were saying, you know, evidence was here, or you know, could his brother had planted this in the house, and because he had access to it, and so yeah, the, again, there was a lot of those things that yeah. you have to go. Yeah, but we were, you know, the de the defense could never um, had and never had the opportunity to ever talk to Tivy Dad. I mean, yeah, that would have been he was thing dead. To do. He was dead. He was dead. He died years yeah. in the, after that, before that in the second trial. But for them to be able to talk to him or initially had been able to talk to him in the, in the first trial, they could have got somewhere or at least mm -hmm. something. But, you know, what, what the prosecution, their position was, hey, wait a minute, we looked at these bodies and Natividad wasn't even in Marysville. He'd been gone. That's, that's, that's the that, best that's, point. That was huge. Yes, that's the best point. They were able to so show and say that... He wasn't there. You know, during all of this killing going on, Natividad was GOA. Yeah, he had fled. You know, he had gone. So they, you know, they put a lot of weight on that, that mm -hmm. it was impossible for Natividad to do it because, you know, he was gone. And, of course, that left Juan holding the bag, <laughs> you know. Now, could there have been like a brother and brother team? Uh, it's, I don't know. It's, I don't know. I don't know if he covered for his brother since his brother was the one that actually brought him up. Yeah. You know, his brother and had the had money. Done a lot. Right. He had the And you gotta remember, Juan Corona was not an American citizen. You know, the first time he came over, you know, he's working and doing all the migrant work. He doesn't even have a green card. He um and then of course he gets shock treatment later on. And uh after that in fifty six they they ship him back because they're like, Hey, you gotta go back, you know, they ship mm -hmm. him back. But the second time he comes back, he gets a green card. But he's never becomes a naturalized citizen. Never. And um you know, I don't know if that played a part in it or not. I don't know. I mean, if people cared one way or the other what happened to them or or whatever. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, it was it was interesting to see you know how he had come in. But mm -hmm. Nativity Dad played a real instrumental part in bringing his brother up, getting situated, getting him you know to get into the farm contracting mm -hmm. business with these ranchers. And um, you know, you never know. You it, never know. It, it could have been a tag team. You know, <laughs> maybe is maybe maybe you know. His brother did one thing with him, and then Juan finished him off. Yeah, as, I, as, I, as I've <laughs> researched this case more, I wish, I wish there were more meat on the bone. Right. Again, I think he's the most likely, but I wish there were more meat on the bone. Yeah, honestly. And, and yeah, and and yeah, I would too. I mean, as a as a former homicide detective, you'd want a lot more to work with, but that would be now. Then you had very little to work with. You know. Be, yeah. You just looked at what you had. And then you just went to a jury and said, hey, here's what we have. And, of course, they all said, hey, guilty, you know. They did. For them, it, was, it seemed like he was the guy. You know, kind of funny. You know, I, I, I've always wondered where Natividad's cafe was. I was like, oh, I wonder what ever happened to In the Guadalajara. downtown Marysville. Yeah, yeah. now it, it's still there. Yeah. It's the Silver Dollar. Yeah. And I've actually eaten there a couple of times with my client. And um, I, I'm always wondering – I wonder if people know that this was owned yeah. <laughs> by the brother of a serial killer and, I don't know, maybe a ser serial killer himself. Yeah. Um, I have no idea if the people there eating there know about the history of that joint. I it Probably if you went up there now, you wouldn't. I don't think a lot of people even know what went on in 71 as far as yeah. stuff like that. Now, maybe in Yuba City, maybe a little bit different mm -hmm. because, of course, that's where the ranches were located. Mm -hmm. But I think a lot of, like, today's local government – want to quickly dispel a lot of that stuff and they don't want any connection to it. So they don't talk about it. They don't bring it up. They have no festivities. They don't do yeah. anything. 
You know, they just, it was something that happened then and this is now. Well, the Silver Dollar, uh, Natividad Corona's old Guadalajara Cafe is now one of the kind of coolest places to hang out in downtown Marysville. If you go there, it's in the yeah. old town, um, right across from that little grassy area still there. And um, nobody knows. Um, right. So so Juan ended up getting reconvicted of all the crimes and ended up spending the rest of his life in prison. As you said, in 1978, I think it was 1978, or was it 1982, when he confessed to the Mexican consulate that he killed, that he he was the murderer? I want to say 1982. Okay. Uh, that he, 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 he confessed. Yeah, he, he confessed, um, well, I think it was 78, 1978, okay. he, he confessed to the Mexican consulate that he, he was the murderer. But again, a lot of people think by that time, he had dementia, he had schizophrenia, you know, he was, you know, whatever. He later denied that, you know, he was just going along with the program. Right. And he said, you know, but I'm crazy and you can't judge crazy people by your laws. Um, who knows if that was true or not? Yeah. But an interesting case, Juan Corona. Oh, yeah. It, uh, it just, it, but it leaves a lot of question marks. You know, I mean, obviously the jury felt that with the information they had, they convicted him. But looking at it modern day, as a former homicide detective, I look at a lot of the things that I would want to know. You know, and of course, you know, the DNA, I mean, that's stuff they just didn't have. But, of course, if you had it now, you could have the DNA. You could really trace a lot of that back. But, um, you know, it was uh, it was very thin. They were It was a thin evidentiary case, I believe, in my opinion. Uh, but they convicted him. Because when once they brought up the brother, I remember back then I thought, oh, wow, now, okay, that could be a roadblock. Now they've mm-hmm. got his brother, but they seem to kind of, you know, go by that. After the jury kind of did, huh? Yeah, they just kind of like, yeah, okay, it could be because it, because the prosecution come up and said, hey, no, Tevi Dad wasn't here. He took off here, all this, mm-hmm. and they were they convinced the jury that hey, the guy wasn't here. You know, mm-hmm. Juan was here. Uh, his brother was in Mexico, and so the jury just figured, well, that's what the prosecution is telling us, so it's got to be the truth. And so they went with it, and uh, yeah, it didn't work out. But it was it was a it was a it was a good move by the defense, his second team. Yeah, the second team was good. And you know, he did take the stand. Juan did take he the did. stand in his defense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but he was only asked two questions. Yeah, and I was surprised that the prosecution didn't make more hay of it. No, um, but they really didn't. No, like they they, didn't. Were, they were given a big softball. Maybe they felt they didn't need to. Maybe they felt. I, I kind of think that's what it was: is they weren't going to raise any other issues. They mm-hmm. were just going to let him speak, and then I think they felt that they had enough that the jury was going to convict him. And you know, and I've always thought about this because at that time, at least in 1978 through 82, when his second trial was occurring, um, you know, his name was his name, right? Right. He was Juan Corona by that time, and I think when you get a jury. And they think, oh, I'm a Juan Corona case. Like, I, I'm, I'm on the Juan Corona case. Of course he's guilty. Yeah. He's Juan Corona. Yeah. Right? Uh, yeah. I can't help but with humans, that comes into play a little bit. Yeah. It, it's, um, you know, it after he was convicted and he went to prison, I mean, people still talked about it a lot. But over the years, you could see how it slowly faded. Yeah. And he, to the, you know, he became actually a forgotten serial killer. Or killer or mass murder. Yeah, yeah. And so that's one of the reasons I wanted to do this, John, um, with you, because I think it's pretty interesting how, even in California, where we're right down the road from Marysville and Yuba City, where these yeah. occurred, and parts of the trial happened all throughout Northern California. But people have really forgotten about this guy. Right. They just have. And I'm not trying to keep him his memory alive because he's anybody, right? right? But I just find the human... The, that humans are interesting and what we choose to remember and what we choose to forget. I don't even think people remember when he was attacked while he was in prison. He lost his eye. He was stabbed about 32 times in a fight, and he lost his eye. He got his eye poked, too. So he lost his eye, and that kind of, I think, really physically set him back. Mm-hmm. But stabbed 32 times, and he survived. <laughs> survived. <laughs> <laughs> and that's while he was at Vacaville. Yeah, that was before the second trial. Right, before the second trial. That's right. He gets stabbed because it was a bumping incident in the in the hallway. And by the way, in that case of the bumping incident, where uh, in when he was stabbed thirty two times, even in that case, there are allegations that boyfriends were involved. Right. So yes. it, that continues to be an underlying yep. current of of this case and. I wish, you know, I could find out how, you know, much of an influence that played in this, right? Yeah, we'll never know. But 
when you look at that stabbing incident, you know, and they talk about the people that were involved, and of course they mm-hmm. tried them for uh, the assault and all that. But one of them, they had mentioned that one of them was the lover of one of the individuals that were bumped, and so there was they apparently there was some disrespect mm. that Juan had showed to this person, and so you can't help but think, well, what did he say to him? What did mm-hmm. he do? Uh, if he bumped him, what did he? I mean, what was said? I mean, we'll never know that. So it only it just leads you to wonder, you know, what it really was. I mean, yeah. what really went on? You know, there's probably a lot that we really don't know. I agree. Because it just wasn't something that was done at the time. Mm-mm. Where now it's, I mean, it's like you're so meticulous about everything. Right. You know, but not anymore. And he was a then. little guy. Yeah. And he was old. Yeah. And they still, so there, I think there was something else there. Yeah. Um, anyway, Juan, the Juan Corona story, um, again, for a brief period of time, he was America's most notorious serial killer, not that long ago and not that far away from where you and I are sitting right now. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the ride. I hope you've enjoyed this story. Um, if you like what you hear, subscribe. And I want to thank you, John Cabrera again. My pleasure. Always. You're one of the best, man. Um, I don't know what we'll talk about next, but let's let's talk about that. We'll yeah, talk there's about plenty of them here in, that pass through Sacramento. I don't know what it is about Sacramento. I always claim it's the water, <laughs> so I don't know. But uh, uh, it's for some reason uh, these killers and these these people that are involved in these types of murders uh, are they're attracted. attracted to Sacramento. Here we are. Thank you. We'll see you next time. Hey, if you like what you hear, like and subscribe. It really means a lot, and we would love to have you coming back every week. Thank you.